Hey, what's up everybody? Today I'm going to be talking about the Ayuma A70 amplifier. It's a two-channel amplifier. They state it as 2 by 300 watts, but it actually does a little bit less than that. Frankly, not surprised. Most manufacturers tend to use the highest number that they can possibly achieve in their marketing. But I will say that this is a nice, solid amplifier that has taken a good bit of abuse sat powered on for days at a time, only warm to the touch, not extremely hot, no power failures, the protection circuit works as it should, gives about maybe roughly 80 watts per channel into eight ohm per two channels. And then for four ohm, it's a little bit higher, closer to about maybe around 200, just kind of depending on where you draw the line. And I'll show you what I'm talking about when we get to that point. Now, subjectively, what I did was I did some ABX testing. And in that ABX testing, I compared it to a 200 watt at 8 ohm or 500 watt at 4 ohm. And again, depending on how you look at the specs, monoblock amplifier. And what I did was I used two of those monoblock amplifiers. They're from March Audio. They are the P501. They use the Purify Class D modules inside. And they're about $1,500 a piece. So you're talking about $3,000 per pair. While this guy retails for about $200, depending on which power supply you get. In that subjective listening test, the only difference that I really noticed was, no surprise, the P501 monoblocks delivered more power. So I was listening to both the amplifiers blind. I had no idea which one was playing. I just pushed a button, it would switch to one of the amplifiers and I had to basically guess. In those guesses, it was just a toss of a coin. Like who knew what was what? And the only times that I could really tell a difference was when I started to try to push the output levels. Keep in mind that for my ABX testing, it is essential that you match the power output between the two different amplifiers. So I did that, I used a voltmeter and an SPL meter just to make sure that I was within about a half a decibel between the two different sets of amplifiers. And in doing so, what I noticed, yeah, the 501s, the monoblocks had more power. They had more dynamic range and I could just turn them up louder. That aside, there really wasn't any difference. I couldn't reliably tell a difference in tonality. I couldn't reliably tell a difference in sound stage or transparency or resolution or any of the other many audiophile buzzwords that we like to attach to things to make ourselves feel like our hearing is somehow superior to others. And I promise you, if you do a legitimately true blind ABX test, you're gonna be very surprised that you probably can't tell the difference yourself. For most of my listening, the power from this was adequate. I was about 10 feet away or so of the SVS Pinnacle Ultras, like their new big bad boys that are about $5,000 a pair. And their average sensitivity, I would say, is around 86 decibels. So at 10 feet away for 86 decibel sensitivity speakers from this guy, it was adequate. Now, could I rock out the way I wanted to? No, because I just started running out of gas on this guy. It just wasn't enough to drive to the insane levels that I might want to. But I think for most people in a medium to smaller sized room with reasonably efficient or sensitive, it's not the same thing, but sensitive speakers, you'd be okay. You shouldn't have to worry about, am I gonna have enough power? But if you're thinking about using these in a home theater, maybe where you're sitting further away, or maybe you have speakers that are low in sensitivity, closer to around, 80 to 84, 85, then you might still need more power. Look at some of the features here. We got a big volume knob on the front. Push it to turn on. I like that click sound. There also is RCA input and XLR input. And when you engage either of those, they'll light up accordingly. Flip it around the back and you can see the top has the XLR. And then here are the RCAs. And you'll notice there's also a subwoofer pre-out. In addition to the subwoofer pre-out, there is a 12 volt trigger. So if you wanted to have this triggered on, then you could do that maybe by your AVR or something like that. You don't have to get up, push the button to turn it on. It'll just trigger on automatically. Talking about the subwoofer pre-out. Now, in past reviews of similar items to this, where they do have subwoofer pre-outs, they, they don't enable a high pass filter for the main. And that is my gripe. I wish there was a way around it, but at this price point, you're just not gonna get that. So I'm not gonna to continue to harp on that, but I think it's only fair to mention it because I've mentioned it in my other reviews. The subwoofer pre-out is variable in terms of low pass filter. 
So on the bottom, it says what 150 Hertz up to 600 Hertz. I do have data showing you what that means. That's cool. But what I wish is that when you turn that little knob to engage the crossover, I wish it would also engage the crossover for the mains, because in my opinion, the main purpose of having a subwoofer besides just getting low frequency, right? I mean, duh. But the main benefit is you take the load off of your main speakers and therefore you increase dynamic range of your system as a whole. So that's why I wish manufacturers, when they do include subwoofer preouts, would somehow give you an option for engaging a high pass filter for your main. I'll leave it at that. The other thing I do like about how Aima does their speaker outputs is how they have them staggered. A lot of brands will just kind of in the same row, they'll have their outputs for the speakers. I like that Aima staggers them, especially when you compare it to amplifiers that are small, but they have them staggered up in pairs, top and bottom. As I mentioned earlier, this does come with a 48 volt five amp power supply, or you can pay about $20 more and get the 10 amp power supply. And speaking of that, let's look at my data real fast. What you have on the screen is power versus distortion, okay? And for what it's worth, negative 40 decibels of distortion is about 1%. We start off at about 0.1 watts and we drag out until basically the amplifier begins clipping or it goes into protect. So we're gonna start looking at the eight ohm first. The eight ohm is in this light blue and I'm showing it about what is that, 82 watts or so before you start ramping up in distortion pretty significantly. At 1%, it's about 114 watts. If I use four ohm static load, then it goes to about, what is this, 144, 144 watts at four ohm before it ramps up. Now you can see that it gets to here and then it shoots back over here. And if you're paying attention, you may think, well, how is there less power? Cause you're supposed to be adding, right? Like I'm supposed to be increasing the input signal I should be getting more and more power until basically it just turns off. Well, that's what happened. It went into protect and the reading was so low that it just threw it off. Realistically, if you're listening just to straight test tones, which you're probably not gonna do and I would not advise, you're gonna get to about 144 watts, maybe 150 watts before you're gonna send this thing into protect. For music, I never went into protect. Now I was pushing this amplifier to max power, but it never went into protect. If you feed it test tones, then yeah. Now there are some cases where I have pushed an amplifier into protect while listening to music, but in this particular case, that didn't happen. If I looked at two ohm, cause I'm just curious, what does it do at two ohm? Even though it's not rated for two ohm, what happens? Well, basically the same thing. You go to about 150 Watts and then you cap out and then you're done. The testing that I like to do in addition to the static eight, four and two ohm testing is complex and simple load testing. The complex and simple loads are done to mimic a real loudspeaker because the standard static loads, no speaker, maybe electrostats, like might be close to it, but no speaker is just the same resistance throughout. That's why it's called impedance. You don't call it a resistance. The impedance is basically changing resistance from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. And because of the drive units that are in the speaker and the crossover components that are in the speaker, as well as the enclosure, you're gonna have a different effect at a different frequency on the resistance. And that's why we call it impedance. So using those different loads to mimic a real loudspeaker, let's see what we get with a simple load, which is closer to an eight ohm speaker, closer. It's not, it's not exactly, but it's kind of closer to a standard eight ohm speaker. You're looking at about the same result as you get for eight ohm. So that jobs with what I typically get you're again around eh, about 82, maybe 87 watts or so before you just ramp up in distortion. With a complex load, which is closer to a four ohm speaker and uh, harder to drive, a little bit harder to drive than most standard speakers, you're gonna get to about maybe 185 watts. If you compare my results to Aima's spec results, my results actually mimic theirs. So I would say that they might very well be using the five amp, which I applaud them for because they could have done the 10 amp power supply and given you possibly higher values. And, and so I appreciate when a company, you know, if they're going to do one, maybe do the lower one. So we have an idea of what to expect. Now let's look at the frequency response. Starting with the static loads of four ohm and eight ohm, we can see that there's very little variability or load dependence for 
this amplifier. It does about, what, almost half a dB down at about 20 hertz. I mean, not a huge deal. And on the top end, there's maybe another half a dB at 20 kilohertz for 4 ohm. But again, not a huge deal. Some cases I'm used to seeing more variability where it may be one decibel up between 8 and 4 ohm. But what happens when I do a complex load? I'm going to get rid of these guys and look at the complex load and the simple load. Now, see, we do have variability here. Ideally, what you want is for the amplifier to not behave differently regardless of the load that you present to it, whether that be a static 4 ohm load like I have here. See how that's kind of flat throughout? Or a speaker load, which are represented by the green and the orange here. Now, when we get up to about 2K, we start seeing variability. With other amplifiers, the variability may be much more significant. So let me give you a quick example of that. Here, what I'm comparing is the complex load attached to the AEMA A70, which I'm testing here, versus the AEMA A07, which is a design that is more load dependent. So we have the load dependent version, the A07 in purple, and see how you have these swings of over half a decibel? That is more likely to be audible than these lower swings of about, what is that, 0.2 decibels, so two tenths of a decibel. Not as big a deal. Earlier I mentioned the subwoofer's variable crossover. So I'm gonna show that here. This is set to the maximum, and then this is set to the minimum. So that does it for my review. You know, the basic wrap up is it does rated power, if you sit and listen to speakers within about 10 feet or so in a medium to small sized room, the power that this does is gonna be adequate. I wouldn't really have any kind of concerns with that. As far as the subjective sound, the transparency, the holography, the dynamicism, all those things. You know, if you're comparing it to an amplifier and you've got them level matched, I'd be surprised if you notice the difference. If you're being honest with yourself and you're doing a true ABX blind listening test, I'd be really surprised if you heard a difference. But in terms of power, if you're trying to get more output, let's say you're listening typically at 85 decibels at 10 feet away, and you want some room for dynamics, then you might need a little bit more power. If you don't really listen that loud, then this will be okay. All in all, for 200 bucks, I give it some thumbs up. Some, if I had more, I guess I could give it more. It's a good product. I like the package. It does well. I like that it didn't break on me, and that's not a shot at anybody. I'm just saying... When you play around with lower cost amplifiers that do pretty good power, sometimes there's that fear of, man, this thing's probably not going to last long. So that's why I like to kind of put them through the ringer in my testing and let them sit powered on for days at a time. I do keep a fire extinguisher nearby just in case, and I'm serious. So with that said, it's a good amplifier. I don't really have any qualms recommending it. If you are interested in purchasing it, I'll see if I can find an Amazon affiliate link and you can go through that. If you want to, that would help me out, but you don't have to. But if you do want to support this channel, that is one way. Alternatively, you can go to patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. If you're wondering where the speaker reviews are, I promise they're coming. I've run into some issues, but I promise they're coming. I am I need them just as much as you do right now. I need something in my life to work for me right for a change for the first time in like a month. Just saying. So. Hold on to your seats. I promise that it's coming. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.